Hello and welcome to the Gnostic Warrior radio show and podcast broadcasting from GnosticWarrior.com in San Diego, California to around the world. I'm your host, Mo, and today on the show we have the Wisdom Warrior, Bodhi Sanders. Dr. Bodhi Sanders is a lifelong student of wisdom literature and the martial arts. He is a multi-award winning author of seven books most of which focus on integrating universal wisdom, honor, and integrity into one's personal life. Dr. Sanders has studied martial arts for over 25 years and is a three-time martial arts hall of fame inductee. He holds a black belt in Shotokan Karate and has also studied ninjutsu, jujitsu, and Krav Maga. Dr. Sanders has also had extensive training in holistic arts, earning degrees in both natural health and naturopathy along with degrees in sociology and English as a second language. He is also a Reiki master and master of acupressure. In addition, he is a certified personal fitness trainer, certified specialist in martial arts conditioning, and has extensive training in the fields of survival arts, meditation, herbology, and body work. I happen to be a fan of his great work and it's truly an honor to interview him. Thanks for being on the show today, Dr. Bodhi Sanders. How you doing? I'm good, Mo. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. And how would you like to be addressed? Oh, you can just uh, call me Bodhi. I, I, <laughs> I've been called much worse. <laughs> <Bodhi's> good. <laughs> great. You know, and I've been a longtime fan of your work, The Wisdom Wire. You've been doing this for several years now, and probably one of my most favorite websites, books, and then also your Facebook page. Every day you're putting out some great wisdom and, and knowledge, and I really appreciate it. Well, thank, yeah, you. And thank you. That's very nice of you to say. My pleasure, Bodhi. You definitely are not a man that's lazy, and you're pursuing knowledge and things that make you a better person in what you do. So that's kind of the reason I wanted to list those accomplishments of what you've done so the listeners have a background that you're not just a guy with a black belt dispensing wisdom to people. You actually have the, the background, too. Yeah, I've been studying... Um, wisdom literature since uh, since I was a kid, really, and uh, I, I don't know why. Just uh, that's something that clicked with me. I've always enjoyed uh, you know quotes and, and wisdom literature, and I remember when I was uh, probably middle school age or maybe a little older. Uh, my great granddad had a book called Apples of Gold, and uh, you know I just you know I, I got that book and and just poured through it and. You know, just after that point, I just kind of wanted to get my hands on as much wisdom and knowledge as possible, and and, uh, that's kind of where it started. We know a lot about your history, your recent history. Can you tell us a little bit about that background as far as where you grew up and before you got to where you are now? Uh, Sure. I I grew up in Mississippi, rural Mississippi, and uh, ended up going to school at Ole Miss. you know, back then it, it was a totally different environment than than what we have now. And as a kid, you know, I, I spent most of my weekends going out, partying, street fighting, and and uh, this was before I ever got into martial arts. And then uh, got into bodybuilding in college. And after you know spending some time you know studying nutrition and bodybuilding and and that lifestyle kind of evolved into the martial arts and from there I I, you know my first training in martial arts was in in Shotokan in uh, Monroe Louisiana and uh, from there I just kind of everywhere we moved I found someone who was able to instruct me and I could learn from and and just kind of furthered my uh, martial arts training and uh, ended up getting a black belt in Shotokan and uh, after that, started branching out and studying uh, different styles of martial arts and just kind of using what I thought worked for me and discarding what didn't work. You talked a little bit about being a rebel and your experience on the streets. Do you think that martial arts had helped, you know, taming that beast inside of you where you didn't want to fight anymore and being able to channel that energy better? Actually, it did. Um, you know, I used to... I used to get in fights almost every week, and uh, 
since I started studying martial arts, I don't think I've had to use my uh, my martial art techniques except for once, and uh, that's been over what 30 years, something like that. Started in 1984, um, so yeah, it, it did kind of settle me down. I started studying, you know, as I mentioned, I, I got a uh, black belt in Shotokan, so I studied the works of uh, Master Funakoshi, and you know, his books had a, a big effect on me and, and you know, his lifestyle, and um, then, yeah, plus the wisdom literature that I was studying at the same time. So it, it kind of changed my philosophy. Instead of going into a, a pub and then you know looking around thinking you know I, I can you know whip anybody in here, you know I go in there and, and think well you know you know how would I get out of here if something happens without fighting, and so it's a different philosophy. Yeah, I definitely feel that it's it's helped me with channeling my energy and doing it in a more productive manner. You know, I do it in the dojang now, and I'm able to recognize things and, you know, notice my environment better than before, where before I might go in there with a bad energy. Now I go in with a calmness, and I'm a, a observer, but I also know that I could handle my situation and anything that might happen in that environment develop an awareness of your environment, which, you know, if, if you have a, a good martial arts instructor, they're going to be teaching you not just kicks and punches and chokeholds and, and, and techniques, but they're also going to be teaching you character, honor, they're going to be teaching you de-escalation techniques on, on how to get out of a situation without having to use your, your martial arts skills. Um, you know, so it's, it's a uh, what, what's the word I want to? I'm looking for here. It's just a total change of attitude about how you see things. And you know, when you go into a bar now, instead of you know looking who you know who might be trouble and who you might have to you know fight to get out, you're just aware of your surroundings and you don't let yourself get into that situation to start with. I like how you put that, Bodhi, because my instructor, he's an old school. Hapkido teacher in Taekwondo, and he, he comes from that old school where, you know, violence and, and using your your defense and your tools is kind of the last thing that we should resort to, and he does teach some of those those acting lessons that you should do if you're confronted before you should use your your tools that you have in your tool shed. Right, and, so, and yeah, in, today, in today's world, too, you have to handle it, uh, you know, self-defense encompasses more than you know, physically defending yourself, especially today. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you get in a fight with somebody today, even if you're defending yourself, you hurt them, and it comes out in court that you're a, a uh, martial arts specialist, a black belt, then they're going to look at you like, well, you should have been able to control this situation. You should have been able to handle this without hurting him or just, you know, control him without busting him up and, and injuring him like this. And it's, uh, it's a lot more responsibility placed on martial artist and a lot of dojos don't make that clear to their students and a lot of a lot of people get in trouble because of that and and I I'm you know not a big fan of MMA uh and that's one of the points it seems one of the reasons why it seems like you know from what I've seen that the M MMA people are more into you know being tough and being fighting you know, getting into fights and roughhousing, and uh, it's more the attitude that you know we had when you know we were young. We were street fighting. And that's what I'm seeing from MMA, and and that's growing so fast that you know it, I'm if they're not teaching the character and honor aspect, then they're they're setting kids up to to get themselves in trouble on the streets. Yeah, in, in more ways than one, you know, and to to follow up with you on your, your statement in regards to, you know, knowing martial arts and getting in trouble with a live, heard of several stories since I've been in the dojang about that happening, and even my my master's son, who was also a black belt, actually had charges brought up against him after he was attacked um, when he was 17 and by an older gentleman, like of 25, 26 years old, and he ended up breaking the guy's jaw in his eye socket, but he ended up having charges brought against him because of his martial arts skills. And then 
they had to drop everything altogether. So there's definitely there. And I, I think this correlates to, you know, the wisdom warrior where, you know, people hear warrior and they automatically think fight or war. And it, it's much more than that. Can you explain exactly what a wisdom warrior means to you and your goal with dispensing this wisdom to others? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, to me, you know, wisdom of the warrior or warrior wisdom, which is what my uh, series of books is entitled, is, uh, you know, how to live a warrior lifestyle. Not I don't teach techniques or, you know, choke holes or how to break a bone or how to do this, any kind of joint locks. You know, everything in my books is about, you know, character, honor, living you know, the right way and how to live your right life with looking at uh, right and wrong instead of, you know, what's personally best for you. And, um, well, actually, that is what's best, you know, for people, but most people don't, you know, can't quite grasp that yet. But um, <clears throat> as far as uh, the Wisdom Warrior, that's my uh, website that I set up. And uh, it's specifically to, you know, teach people how to live a warrior lifestyle. And uh, what I mean by the warrior lifestyle is a lifestyle that you know, revolves around issues of right, and wrong, uh, character, honor, integrity. And, you know, this is just, it's not getting taught in a lot of the dojos today. And, I, you know, being a school teacher, you know, I know that it's not getting taught in the schools. And so if the parents are not teaching the kids or they don't have a very special martial arts instructor, uh, chances are they're not getting you know, this information. They're not getting uh, you know, the, the wisdom of, of living the warrior lifestyle, living by a code of ethics, uh, living with character, honor, and integrity. So they're just out on their own, and they pick up their you know, the way of life you know, from their friends or, or whoever they, may happen, they happen to be around, and uh, they're missing it. And, and we're starting to see that in today's, you know, 20, 30 years old and, uh, you know, younger. It's just they're not getting the the character training that used to be common, especially in the United States. Yeah, so you saw this as, as something missing and, and something needed, so you decided to step up to the plate and, and provide that not only to people in martial arts, and obviously there's a lot of... I, I honestly found you, Bodhi, from my wife, who is not into martial arts, but's into wisdom and, and music, and she found your YouTube channel. Yeah, I, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, my readers are not martial, martial artists. I've got housewives, I've got uh, doctors, psychologists, uh, you know, a lot of people use my books, you know, teachers use them in the classroom, uh, they're being used in jails, you know, with, uh, uh, youth detention centers to help kids and it's uh it's grow it snowballed into more than i ever imagined when i started this it was just a graduation present for my uh for my son and i started just handwriting this down in, in a journal i got from barnes and noble and worked on it for years you know i, you know, I started on it when he was in middle school and worked on it until he graduated. And every time I would come back to him, I would set it down and, and come back in a month or several weeks later. And I would look at it and I would say, you know, this is good stuff. I, you know, I would actually buy this book if it was in Barnes & Noble. And, uh, you know, one day I thought, well, you know, I wonder what would happen if I actually sent it out to, you know, some publishers. And I sent, sent uh, four uh, book proposals out and ended up getting two offers back. And wow. I, you know, this is, you know, you know, pretty interesting. And, um, you know, my, both of my boys have a, you know, handwritten copy, you know, that I personalized for each of them for their graduation present. present. Mm -hmm. And, um, when, um, you know, I hope they take care of it because that's going to be something that means a lot to them later. It is. And, and, and if, if you look at that, Bodhi, when I, I look at, the beginnings uh, that you had told me the story it's it's a labor of love it wasn't about right. hey i'm going to create a book and make money and be you know an author of the year and all this stuff it was no ego put in it but love from your heart right and uh, yeah so that that's I, where you, you know, stand I, I've out i've <laughs> been collecting 
you know, I have a quote book, and I've been working on that for years and years before I even started writing my other, just because I love, you know, wisdom and I love quotes. And mm -hmm. um, I had, uh, you know, start, you know, every book I got is, is highlighted, you know, from, unless it's not a good book, of course. But uh, if it's good, you know, it's highlighted from cover to cover. And, and I got to thinking, well, you know, I got to, you know, look for a quote, and then I can't remember what book it's in. And I have to go through my vast library to find it. So I started taking those quotes and just, you know, put them in, in categories on um, the computer. And then I ended up saying, you know, this, this would make a great quote book. And I took those, compiled them into uh, what is now Wisdom of the Elders, and uh, that is, you know, hit the top ten, you know, twice and won, you know, several awards. So it's, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's like comes back to the whole saying, if you do what you love, you know, you're going to be successful, you know, sometime with that. Yeah, definitely, and you're you're a testament to that. You know, and like I said, this is definitely a, a labor of love that has turned out to touch thousands, if not millions of people across the world. And again, it just started out as something you were doing for your boys. So it's, it's what a cool story. Oh, thank you. And yeah, definitely. And, and on top of, you know, your years of training in martial arts and being an author, you also are big into the whole holistic way of life that you call the warrior lifestyle, which we had, you know, went over the wisdom and some of the martial arts. What is this holistic part of it? Well, you know, everything has to be in balance. In life, you need to have balance. And the way I, I teach my students is you can look at life like a triangle. And the three points are uh, your spirit, your mind, and your body. And you want to keep those three aspects of your life in balance. And, you know, holistic, you know, basically just means you know, being whole. And so if you have those parts of your life in balance, then you're living a holistic lifestyle. You know, I know when, when we say holistic today, you know, we think about, you know, stuff like herbs and, and vitamins and whole foods, that type thing. But that's, you know, that encompasses that because that's part of, of you know, your, the physical part, you know, staying healthy, staying in shape. But there's more to it. And a lot of dojos that teach they only focus on the physical part, not even the the holistic physical part, where you you know, integrate the health, uh, your lifestyle, but just on physical techniques and staying in shape. And when I teach, I teach all that. Plus, I teach the uh, mental part, you know, getting knowledge and wisdom, and the spiritual spiritual part, uh, you know, integrate it with meditation, uh, energy work. And Reiki, that type thing, and so I, I, you know, I think that you know, no matter what you're doing, balance is the key, and uh, it's definitely the, the key to the warrior lifestyle. Yeah, no, I agree. That's something that I'm coming into now, being in my 40s. I was highly, highly unbalanced um, in my younger years, and and I'm finding more balance now. You know, coming into martial arts, and then I, I'm also a big pursuer of knowledge and wisdom, and that actually started superseding taking care of my spiritual side of my life and my physical side, and then also my health is in regards to eating. So I started quickly realizing that I needed to balance all these different parts of my life, and when I do that, I'm so much more happy. And when I'm out of balance and out of whack, I am completely miserable. Yeah, it's uh. Yeah, it definitely is easy to get out of balance. You know, I've even, as much as, as I've studied and, and as much as I teach and, and you know, know about all this stuff, it's still easy for me to get out of balance. I've been working you know, probably 90-hour weeks here for, for months. And, uh, you know, just because, you know, the books have taken off so much. And I I bought the rights to my books back from my publisher. So I am, you know, the publisher and the marketing department and everything on my own as well as working full-time job and uh yeah it's very easy just to get focused on that and just you know you're working all the time and then you let your meditation slide or your workout slide because you've got so much to do and uh yeah, it really takes work to stay in balance it doesn't happen naturally you have to you have to have discipline yourself and and demand that you keep your life in balance. If you don't, it's going to get out of balance in one, one place or the other. Yeah, and that part of being a warrior is being self-reliant, and 
it looks like now you're a business owner. You are basically own your own publishing company. You own right. the rights to your books and you're shipping them out. So not only are you, you know, a martial artist and a teacher, are you, what, a teacher in, are you middle school or yeah, high school? Right now I'm teaching middle school. I, I, for, you know, most people say, oh my God, I can't believe you're teaching middle school. How, how can you stand those kids at that age? But I've always liked uh, that age group. You know, they seem open to learning. They listen. They're, they're still wanting to learn. And, uh, so I, you know, I've had chances to teach at college, and, and you know, I've taught high school, but I kind of like you know this age group for some reason. Yeah, no, I, I have four boys and, and one girl, and I know that you know being a teen myself one day, and then having my boys, which you know I have one that's twenty three, twenty one, and a fifteen year old now, that the middle school is, seems to be the <clears throat> the dividing point where they either go the left hand path or the right hand path, exactly. and I think. You you were put there for a reason, and they need someone that's tough but also wise to help lead them. So I'm sure, not only are you touching people, you know, with your books and your wisdom, you're also touching, you know, young teens. So that's that's awesome that you're doing that. Thank you. And yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, and most people don't realize that they think that high school is where you really got to start, you know, watching out for problems. But those problems usually start in middle school, and uh, I would say most people you know, would be shocked by that. And uh, you know, it, it even it happened with my own son. You know, we, we, at the time, we didn't know what was going on. And he was in middle school, and, and he was being bullied. And and, and we're talking about a big kid. You know, he was, I, I've been training both of my sons in martial arts since they were uh, four and six. And, uh, you know, so by the time he was in middle school, he could definitely defend himself. And, but he just uh he wouldn't do it he wouldn't take up for himself for one reason or the other and we didn't know what was going on we thought everything was fine and that had, you know affected him for years and years and it affected affected him all through high school and you know just most parents don't realize that you know it's never too early to really start teaching you know the character traits honor integrity and really start talking to your to your sons and daughters as if they're adults and not just little kids, because by the time they get to middle school in today's society, they are hearing and knowing more than we did when we were in, you know, seniors in high school. And it's uh, it's a totally different world today, and, and most people, you know, just haven't uh, yet come to that realization yet. And uh, it, you know, as far as why they don't defend themselves, I think the kids that that can defend themselves. But don't, you know, and I talked to Stephen, my son, later about that, and he said, well, you know, I'm, you know, you're not supposed to fight at school. I'm following the rules. And so they're, they're trying to put, you know, the character and honor integrity parts that they're taught yeah. in their life, but, in, in, but they just don't quite know when it's, when it's uh, appropriate to, you know, step up and defend yourself and when it's appropriate to follow the rules at that age. And... Uh, you know they're taught in schools, especially today, that you know there is, uh, you know, no breaking the rules, no matter what. If you get in a fight today in in a public school, even if you're defending yourself and two guys jump you, you are expelled just the same as those two guys. There's no, okay, let's look at the facts and see you know who was right and who was wrong. It's just there's a fight, you're out of here. And uh, so it's not you know when I was in school, we used to get in fights all the time and uh, we had a great I had a great principal when I went to school and uh, he would bring you in his office he would talk to you about why you did what you did what happened and if you were right you know he would pat you on the back and tell you you know you were right to defend yourself you never let somebody you know run over you like that you don't let somebody pick on you or beat you up if you were wrong he'd take his paddle out <laughs> he would give you four or five smacks with that paddle chew your butt out and and expect you to change, and you just don't have that teaching in the schools anymore. You know they're you know they're just to to get the uh, scores on the standardized test basically, and any you know, teaching like uh, character traits or honor and integrity, they're afraid to touch because they don't want some parent who doesn't agree with that philosophy coming in and suing the school district. Well, my dad, you know, when I was uh, younger, my dad 
you know, we had, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was. So it was a, a kid that was two or three years older than me. And he was picking on me, and, and somehow he found out about it. And he told me, he said, if you ever back down from a fight, and when you get home, you're going to get a much worse beating than you got would have gotten you know, if you would have fought the guy. And so I, I, after that, I never backed down from a fight. You know, somebody, you know, picked on me, then it was on. Or, and the same thing with my little brother. You know, I got in several fights taking up from my little brother. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just uh, a different uh, different world today. You know, if you did that yeah. today, you know, we had, it, even if, you know, if I would have done today some of the things I did when I was a kid, I would have been not only kicked out of school, but probably in, uh, you know, reform school for fighting. And, you know, that's not the way it should be. You know, boys need to be boys. You know, I'm not talking about going around being bullies and fighting all the time, but I'm talking about standing up for yourself. You know, I've never had right. a, a best friend that we didn't end up in a fist fight at one time or another. And we would, you know, go at it hard. And one or two days later, we're back to being best friends. <laughs> and that can't happen in today's world. You know, two kids fight in the school. They're expelled. They may have restraining orders against them. They, you know, it, it's just... Lawsuits. You know, lawsuits, <laughs> civil suits, you know, that you know, put in their records. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. And we have no common sense you know, in this world anymore. And uh, the boys can't be boys. We're raising a generation of wimps in this country that are afraid to take up from their, for themselves. And that's why, that, in my opinion, martial arts training is so important because they can't just go out in the yard, you know, roughhouse, play football, you know, two of them get in a fight, get in a fight, and then shake hands the next day and be friends again. You know, they, the only place you can act like a boy anymore is actually in the dojo. I agree, you know, and, and sometimes there's a, there's a few teenagers that go there and their, their mothers aren't there and, you know, the, the master will walk the kids out. Oh, don't worry. They had a good time today and they just don't want to see what happens, but they know they need to, to put them in there so they could defend themselves. And I, I think, you know, part of that defense when you were younger and I was younger was, you know, I, I also had fought many of my friends and best friends. And it was like when w- you either stepped over their boundary or they had stepped over your boundary, it was on, and it was like, hey, you don't do that to me, and we're going to fight. And then that guy, whoever steps over your boundary, whether that be a friend, a best friend, or even just an acquaintance, now knows better not to do that to you and will actually learn a lesson not to do it to other people. Right, and but, it's a respect thing, too. Correct. Uh, I, I, yeah, my, I believe it was my freshman year of high school, and I, you know, I was always, you know, really good in sports. And so I was on the football team as my as a freshman. And uh, my school was a smaller school, so it didn't have, you know, a freshman team and a varsity team. It was all, you know, the high school team. And this guy, you know, was pretty much a bully. You know, he was much bigger than me, and he, he came in and was bullying me in the locker room. And then was one day he came in and said, you know, I'm going to, you know, just stump your butt. You know, and I ended up you know, taking a beating, but ended up busting him up pretty good. And uh, after that, you know, the guy treated me like an equal, even though I was like, you know, a freshman. I think he was a junior. Uh, I was accepted as part of the team. You know, nobody picked on me ever again throughout high school, as long as I was at that school. And, uh, you know, that, that that is just part of growing up, in my opinion. But it can't happen anymore, and and so we have boys that that don't get that aspect, and uh, you know we have we even have a lot of martial arts instructors who have never been in a real fight in their life, and I don't know how you teach something that you've never experienced. <coughs> excuse me, that you've never experienced in your life. Um, I remember one of my Shotokan instructors in uh, Durango, Colorado, and. Um, we have a student in there, and we get ready to spar. And he said, "Well, I'm going to let this guy, you know, teach the sparring class because he he can run circles around me. He's you know, street fighter. He's this that." I'm thinking, you know, why aren't you teaching useful techniques? Then, if 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 what you're teaching, and you you've been in martial arts for a long time, 
is not useful in the street. So you have this guy who has you know had half of your training teaching the class, then something's not quite right there. And and the missing <laughs> part is that guy had never been in a real fight in his life. You know, this other guy grew up on the streets. You know, he had the same types of experience that that you know I've been talking about. And he's had actual fights. He knows what it's like to get hit, to hit somebody else, to you know, to actually experience that adrenaline rush and everything that goes along with a real fight. And um, there, uh, I would say the majority of martial artists or martial arts instructors have never experienced that. All they know is what they're taught in martial arts class. They go up through the levels. They get to a certain level where they think they're ready to teach. They start teaching. But still, they've never been in a street fight or any kind of you know fight with you know, boys on a playground or, or anything like that. And so they're, they're teaching things that they don't know about. And they're teaching, it's almost like being an actor. Yeah, and they're, and they're <laughs> teaching, they're teaching uh, sparring techniques instead of fighting techniques. And sparring, you know, if you drop punch somebody in the nose and you draw blood, you're disqualified. So they're teaching you to pull your punches. And when you get on the streets, and you know, when you do this over and over thousands of times, you know, you develop the habit. And when you get on the streets, that can be very dangerous if you. You know, you're used to pulling punches, and you pull your punch. And it's just uh, it's one reason that you know, I quit doing the tournaments with my students when I was teaching. It's just uh, they got to only focus on, well, you know, what do I need to do? What kind of strategy can I use to get the to win this match? And it wasn't, yeah, the most it wasn't beautiful. about you know just fighting. It was about winning the trophies. And I, you know, I started to see that with my boys because they were they were bringing home trunk loads of trophies, and um, I finally said, you know, we need to make some changes. We're not going to do the, the tournaments anymore right now. And I started teaching them more realistic training, which now, you know, you know I, I've done both the traditional and realistic and Krav Maga, and, and um, now what I'm, I'm really when somebody asks me, you know, what they should look for in a martial arts school. I tell them you need a school that teaches realistic training techniques and puts you through you know realistic uh, situations so you can feel that adrenaline rush and you yeah that's about as close as you can get to having that experience of actually fighting or being in a fight without going out and getting in a bar fight or street fight. No, I, I agree completely with that. And and my master again, I had mentioned he's you know old school. Hapkido teacher, and he's also has his black belt in judo as well, and he he believes the same. Well, where of course you honor you know the rights and the the various belts and moves of whatever you're teaching, whether that be taekwondo or hapkido or karate, but you also you tell the truth in regards to what's going to happen in real life. So he's always dispensing those teachings to us in regards to, of course, these are the the moves of the brown belt. These are the moves of the the red belt, but these are the ones that are going to be the most effective. This is what you're going to use in real life. And he always says there's pretty much a bag of 10 or 12 or 15 moves that you're really ever going to actually use and probably around four or five that you're, you're really going to you know, use more, most often. And a lot of them are just kind of part of the belt system to, to get in your black belt. They all, right. of course, help each other, but um, a lot of those things you wouldn't use in the street. Yeah, I know, and... and you know, with my you know, training now, I try to to focus on stuff that you know you I can actually use. It's just this uh, kind of like what uh, Bruce Lee said one time. He said, "Don't fear the man who has practiced a hundred or a thousand kicks, a thousand different kicks. Fear the man who's practiced one kick a thousand times." And it's <laughs> just, you you got your techniques. You you might know a hundred different techniques, but it doesn't matter what you know if you can't actually apply it. And uh, I'd ra- I'd rather have three or four techniques that I've perfected than you know, know every single technique in Shotokan and and just be able to, to demonstrate it, but you know I can't put it into actual use. And Master Funakoshi, he he was a sickly kid. You know, if you've ever read his biography, it, it's a great book. And um, yeah, you know, he was a sickly kid and just 
practicing martial arts, he kind of built up his stamina and his health. And he, he stated in one of his books that you, you don't have to have a dojo to practice martial arts. You don't have to have, you know, uh, you know, a big thin garden that you can move around in. He said you can practice arts, martial arts in a uh, six by nine area. And so basically everything that he did, he could do in a uh, six by nine spot. So you can do that in your, you know, your living room. And that's another thing that uh, yeah, I've seen with some of the people that take martial arts is to them, it's, it's not a lifestyle. It's not the warrior lifestyle. It's just a hobby. It's something they do on Tuesday and Thursday nights. And, you know, if they're not there, they're not doing martial arts. They don't stretch at home. They don't practice at home. You know, they don't think about it hardly until they go to class. Well, oh, it's time to go to martial arts class. Let's go. And that's the only time they do it. And and you can't, you know, martial arts has got to be a lifestyle, not a hobby. I mean, you know, it's okay if somebody wants to do it as a hobby, but they shouldn't think that their hobby is going to make them indif indif indispensable and uh, undefeatable on the streets. It's got to be, uh, you know, something that you live every day. I mean, if you're just stretched twice a day, I don't care if you're doing martial arts or football or basketball or whatever, you're, you're not going to have your muscles stretch out. You know, you've got to stretch every day, not twice a week. But um, lots of people, the only time they think of their martial arts practice or or stretching, or doing their katas, or anything like that, is when they're in the dojo, and they don't do anything at home unless, you know, it's the night before the black belt test or something, and they're practicing. <laughs> but, uh, most most people, it's just kind of a hobby and not a, not a lifestyle, and it was never meant to be that way. You know, it, it's been martial arts have been watered down over the years, especially in the United States. You know, I, I've met people from. Russia, different countries, and the training they get. If if the martial arts instructors here train their students like that, they wouldn't have any students. They would all quit. You know, I, I talked to one woman who uh, trained, and she was actually part of the Russian military. And her martial arts instructor had her, and she was like a you know a smaller lady, and she would walk. They would walk down concrete steps on their knuckles, you know, going down the steps with somebody holding your, your legs. They would do all these different trainings in, in, in cold weather and snow, and and uh, it, it's just kind of been dumbed down here. It's been watered down to the point that, well, we don't want to, you know, we want to pull a punch. We don't want to hurt somebody. You can't do this. You do this, but you can't really do it because you'll hurt somebody. And so nobody practices at uh, realistic speeds, and then they, they when you, you know, a lot of that stuff, if you try to do it slowly, it doesn't work, and if you try to do it on a bigger guy, and just go up and, you know, for example, try to put a wrist lock on a bodybuilder, you know, I, there's no way, you know, I can take a bodybuilder, try to put a wrist lock on him while he's standing there, trying to hold against me, and I can't, there's no way I'm going to be able to put him in a wrist lock, you've got to have the element of surprise, where you you know, break that wrist up and then put it in a lock. Yeah, speed and, and surprise, yep. Yeah, and, and see, little, little, there's little things like that that matters and it's not being taught. And then these students are going out thinking they're prepared and they can defend themselves and they end up getting, you know, the street mopped up with them because they don't know what they're doing. They've never used it. They Everything they've been taught in the dojo has been so watered down because the instructor doesn't want to get sued if somebody gets hit or gets hurt, and so he's only going to teach you, you know, the very basic stuff. But you know, it's it's hard to find a really good martial arts instructor today. And, and yeah, I, yeah. Again, I I definitely concur with with what you're you're saying. You know, I I have those personal experiences. I, I, I relate it to in my master when we, we talk about this. He says it's just kind of the commercialization of martial arts exactly. over the last yeah. last 30 years, and, and he feels the same way about MMA. And I know, of course, there is some legitimate, you know, um, quote, MMA dojos out there, but they're far and few between, and they're more, it seems like they're more interested in 
the fame or the money more than the the art. Yeah, you know, a uh, friend of mine who first nominated me for the uh, Martial Arts Hall of Fame, Dr. Charlie Ward, had a big MMA dojo down in uh, Arizona. And he actually had a program, I think it was at Arizona State, where he had an actual martial arts uh, course at the college there. He taught for credit. And um, he told me, he, he was one of my fans, and uh, yeah, he uh, called me one day. He looked me up, got my number and called me, and said, you know, it's really troubling me. And this is this is somebody who's been fighting in one, I don't know, he, he had, a lot of belt. He was in martial arts hall of fame himself, and he had won tons of, of different titles and, and fights and stuff in MMA. And uh, he told me, you know, what I'm seeing in MMA is a total lack of character, honor, integrity. It's all about how to fight and how to hurt somebody. And he says, really, kind of bothering me that I, you know, I'm seeing this everywhere I go in in MMA. And uh, so we talked about that quite a while, and he said, well, "Yeah, that's what I want to do, and that that's why your books are needed. Is you know we need to instill the character traits into MMA, and not just you know how to grapple, how to do this, and how to fight." And he said, "That's what we're we're doing," and uh, he said, "You know, by doing that, all we're doing is training thugs, because if you if you have the ability to fight and hurt somebody." But you don't have the wisdom to know when you should fight or when you shouldn't fight, or what's worth fighting for and what's not, or you know the uh, um, ability to control your temper. Then you're just training people that's going to not only hurt somebody else, but going to get themselves put in jail. And uh, he he was really really into. Put adding that aspect into his MMA dojo, and uh, he, he just said, you know, there's hardly any MMA dojos that I've been to that actually have that aspect. He said they just don't care about that, and and I can see it with the MMA fighters that that I've met. You know, I haven't met a lot of them that I would have, you know, I would say, you know, really um, give that that part of things any attention at all and and that's one reason that i'm not a big mma fan myself and i know uh, Bodhi, that's not like a blanket statement but it does serve as kind of the general overview of what's happening and, and i definitely agree with you and and actually the successful people that i do see in mma that carry themselves well they all have old school training and in, in either you know taekwondo or we're even seeing right. karate yeah, now, I'm and I'm not saying that you know there's no MMA fighters that you know, are quality people at all. That's not what I'm saying. Of but, course, uh, the, it does seem like the MMA dojos that I've been to, you know, they they just don't give that aspect any attention at all. It's all about fighting, grappling, winning, and there's no uh, there's no character training, no no talk about honor or, or doing the right thing. It's just kind of winning. How do I win? So it's, it's more, I look at MMA as more of a sport than a actual martial art. Martial arts covers a wide variety you know, of, of things. So it, you know, sport is a part of martial arts. But when I say that, what I'm talking about is, you know, to me, a martial art has to, inc- a real martial art, or I, I guess I should say a, a holistic or a whole martial art, has to encompass, you know, all of those things, not just how to fight. Yeah, yeah and that's that's pretty much the way you put it, Bodhi, is it's not just about fighting, but it's that balance of everything in your life, whether that be your health, uh, your wisdom of knowing when to fight or, or when not to fight, and stuff like that, it all plays into it, and it takes it away from being just a sport where, you you know, you go spar or go every Tuesday and Thursdays to an actual lifestyle, an artistic lifestyle, of a warrior, right. where you have you have the knowledge, but you also have the backing and the physical ability to kick ass, and and with your mind as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What are your thoughts on using our energy or our chi to change our environment and affect the people around us? Well, it's funny you should ask that one because that's uh, that's what my next book is about. 
is uh, the power of your thoughts, your actions, and, and how you can use that to change your environment and make things the way you want them to be. Um, there's just that that whole field is is really booming right now as far as the uh, the science behind it and the knowledge that we're getting from quantum physics and um, your thoughts are just so much more powerful than than people realize they don't realize that your thoughts actually contain energy and actually do things they they're not just you know not just um, Something inside your head. Thoughts inside your head, they're actual energy, and you need to learn to control your thoughts just like you learn to control your speech and, and your actions because all, all of those three combine to put together to actually manifest what you have in your life. And uh, it's, you know, I, I can give you several examples that I, I, I've used this so I know for a fact that this works. The, uh, uh, you know, I don't care if you call it the law of attraction or karma or whatever you want to call it. You know, I know that it works. You know, what you put out there will come back to you. And you know, that's taught by all the sages throughout the ages. It was taught. It's taught in the Bible. Uh, now, you know, there's lots of books like The Secret and some of those things that, that are teaching parts of that. And that is true. You, you, you know, what you think, as long as you are constantly thinking keeping your thoughts focused on what you want, and you are also taking the action to make that come about. As long as you, you keep your mind focused, you take the action, that will manifest in your life sooner or later. And uh, so you can definitely use energy. and you know, Everybody's using it to change their environment one way or the other, even if they don't know anything about it, because that's the way human beings work. I mean, your thoughts lead to your actions, and what you think, what you say, what you do, basically determines what kind of life you're going to have and what's going to be in your life. And, and, and people, even if they don't believe in, in energy and, and uh, the law of attraction, they're still using it because it's a, uh, it's a universal law. It works no matter if you believe it or not, just like, uh, just like karma, if you... If you do something, it's going to come back. What you put out comes back to you, and that's taught, you know, throughout the ages. I think Buddha taught it, uh, Jesus taught it. Most all of the religious books teach that. You can find the um, golden rule in basically every single religion on the face of the earth. It is stated in a different way, but you can find it. And basically, all the golden rule is if you take the words and you kind of look at them and, and move them around, all it is is the law of attraction and karma, that what you put out comes back. If you don't don't want somebody to do something to you, don't do it to them. You do it to them, they're probably going to do it back to you. And that's, you know, that's basically the energy, energy of your, your thoughts and actions coming back to you. Yeah, and I, I think that's where people fail to realize that it's not just how we act and, and what we, we do to people. It's also the thinking. And I think we're in that time in, in the world where we're actually able to measure it and it's actual a fact. And I know people such as yourself, Bodhi, who've lived for several decades and have, you know, been down different paths and come back to the right path have tried this themselves, whether that be in the negative side when you didn't know you had that energy and you were manifesting negative thoughts and things were happening negatively around right. you to the point where you actually understood what you thought affected people around you and you could actually test it, you know, not meaning that you're testing it to, to mess with people's minds, but you could change your thinking and go, hey, I'm having a negative thought here. Let's get this out of my head and let's think good love thoughts. And it, it re literally changes your environment. It could change the relationship with your wife and your kids yeah. just by what you think. I see that happen in my house. Yeah, and... Any anybody can test this. I mean, I mean, it's just it's it's a scientific fact anymore. It's not even you know debatable whether or not this is actual science or whether or not it works. I mean, just you know you test it by you know thinking of something really really sad, and then see how it changes your emotional state, and then think of something really really happy, 
and see automatically your state has changed. Uh, your thoughts, you know, can change your emotion, can change your, your emotional state in just a second, and, and it happens almost immediately. So just think about, you know, if you're thinking certain thoughts, negative thoughts over and over all day long, every day, you know, of course that's affecting you. And there's no way you're going to do think negative, uh, you know, hate-filled thoughts throughout the day, all day long, every day, when you get home at night, you know, just constantly, and then be living a positive life. It's just not going to work. And, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I, even my books are an example of that. You know, when I first, when I, you know, I started writing these, like I told you, for my sons, and, uh, you know, a colleague of mine that I was working with, I told him, you know, I should maybe think about publishing a book. And, and, and we went back and forth for years, and I kept thinking about it, kept it in my mind, you know, kept coming back to it, handwriting the book. And, and But I, the whole time I was still thinking, you know, this would be a great book. I should publish this. This would be good. I, you know, I need to maybe take the time and find out how to do this. And I just kept thinking about it over and over. And then, you know, I had one, I sent out, like I said, four book proposals and had two offers back. Out of those, one one of the offers, the guy actually contacted me from one of my blogs, contacted me out of the blue, and said, uh, "Yeah, but that was actually before I sent him a book proposal." He contacted me and said, "You know, your your blog writings are are just amazing. Have you ever thought about writing a book?" And that just came out of the blue, not me. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about finding people at the time to uh, you know send manuscripts to or anything it just happened out of the blue after you know me keeping my mind and my thoughts on you know i think i'm going to write a book i'm going to do this i'm going to you know i just need to get this polished i'm going to do this and thinking about you know how i want it to be and and just constantly thinking about it and then out of the blue somebody contacted me a publisher out of reno and uh asked me if i ever thought about writing a book to look at the, I look at the story, Bodhi, as you, as you manifested your reality through through your heart, your thoughts, and your actions, and it was all the right reasons. And you, you look at all the, the the authors out there. How many authors out there could tell that story? Their first first book, they send out four four you know book proposals, and they get two offers back. I think that's maybe the first time in history. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, when I when I started researching this, it, uh, everything I said, I found said that uh, you know you may send out a hundred. Uh, book proposals and not get any offers, so don't get your expectations up. Don't you know? And I, I figured you know, I'm, I'm going to send this out. And, you know, I made, you know, I, I did research on the book proposals, and uh, you know, had a really nice, you know, 40 page book proposal. And I said, you know, I don't see how anybody can turn this down, and I expected to get an offer, and uh, ended up getting two. You got it. And I even got, you know, one of them was from a, a major publishing house in New York. And uh, so I had two at the same time. I ended up going with the, uh, the you know, small publishing company in Reno. And uh, I think that's probably the first time ever that that uh, publishing company in New York had had somebody kind of blow them off. They were shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I think most, they're so well, used to people just being so grateful that they get an offer from them. And, that, you know, and they were they just lay down and, blown away <laughs> that I said... You know, yeah, I, I appreciate the offer, but I've made other arrangements. I think they were just completely blown away. <laughs> With you being a wisdom warrior, Bodhi, I am sure you understand business and you've gathered knowledge to understand how you know the publishing industry works. And it's it's just like any other industry, or having a boss or having a broker above you, where they you know they take a lot of your your money that you make and your resources, and they offer some offer good marketing and some don't. And sometimes you need to recognize that and decide what is best for you. Yeah, they they weren't doing <laughs> you know, any marketing or anything. My books weren't doing anything. Uh, you know, very few people knew about my books or my teachings until I actually bought my the rights to my books back from my publisher and started doing it myself. And almost immediately, uh, I would say within two months of me getting the rights back, and I had to reformat everything, redo the cover art and everything because he wouldn't give me the rights to uh, use the covers. So I had to redo 
the cover art, learn to market everything, learn the whole business, you know, step by step. And within six or seven months after doing that, Modern Bushido hit number one. And, wow. Uh, and I've had five out of the seven books that I bought back from the publisher in the top ten in the last five months. So it uh, it was a big gamble to do that. It cost me a lot of money, but it ended up being the right move. And you, and that's you know, another thing. I, so many times I just kind of go with what I feel, my, my intuition or my mm-hmm. spirit or whatever you want to call it. And I try to, to do that as much as possible, you, even on small things, you know, going to, to the grocery store, you know, I'll think, uh, uh, I'm going to go left instead of right here. I'm going to go a different way. And, you know, just if that pops into my mind, I go that way. And, uh, you know, when I you know, bought the books back, it was, you know, this is a very risky move. You know, we're going to be, you know, responsible for everything ourselves. We have to borrow the money, and, you know, this is going to be very risky. And so we, we, I said, but I feel like that's what we need to do. And my publisher tried to talk me out of it, but he didn't want to give up my books. And I said, no, I just this is where I need to go right now. And uh, worked out, and everything has just snowballed since to the point that I can hardly keep up with all of it. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm like I said, I'm working like 90 hours a week. And anyway, you know how how long it took to get me, uh, you know, on the, <laughs> the <laughs> show the interview <laughs> because, yeah, I, I, I've got so many people waiting for interviews right now, and it's just you know when I. I leave home at uh, like 6.30 in the morning, get back at 5.30. And, you know, I work before I leave you know, for about an hour and a half, and then I work until I go to bed when I get home. So it's just hard to find to catch me with a little free time. <laughs> You're working hard, and success doesn't come easy, Bodie, and I know you know that being in martial arts and then now, of course, being a business owner, a teacher, you know, you got several degrees, so you know what it it's like to work hard. And I know people out there don't understand that that that's one of the the things in having success is discipline, and then working hard day in and day out to make that happen. But in the same breath, we need to take time for ourselves and also bring calmness to our life. And I feel meditation definitely will help a lot of people out there who are looking to succeed or high level people. Can you tell the audience how meditation will help them and maybe some techniques that you recommend? Well, there's just tons of of benefits to meditation. And just like like your thoughts and and, uh, the law of attraction, it's scientifically proven, too. Um, You know, meditation, you know, I, I can tell a big difference when I meditate and when I don't. You know, if I don't meditate, you know, I start getting stressed when I'm working so hard. I, you know, yeah, you can feel the stress building up. I'm not as relaxed. I'm not as calm in, in stressful situations. Uh, you know, it, it decreases your your heart rate, uh, increases blood flow. It, um, it increases your tolerance. You know, I, I can tell I'm much more patient and tolerance tolerant when I'm meditating on a regular basis. Um, that, you know, I feel that's something that should be taught in every martial arts school, and not many do because they, you know, a lot of the, the martial arts guys kind of see that as, you know, spiritual mumbo-jumbo or, you know, or useless waste of time or whatever, and uh, a lot of dojos don't, teach, don't touch it at all. They don't want to touch anything that could be spiritual, and, you know, it goes back to what you said a while ago, that uh, and what your your instructor teaches that uh, martial arts has become all about making money, not teaching what needs to be taught for somebody to live, you know, the life, the warrior lifestyle, or a balanced life, but making money. And okay, so if I teach meditation, then I'm going to maybe alienate you know a group of Christians who don't believe in it, or this group, or yeah, I mean, gotcha. make these students upset, these parents upset, because I'm teaching, uh, you know, Eastern techniques to their kids, and they don't believe in that kind of thing. So I, I, I better not touch that. And I think that's the way the majority of the uh, martial arts instructors look at at that. Uh, so they're missing out a major part of 
you know, warrior training and the warrior lifestyle. If you look back at uh, people like Musashi, uh, all all the the um, ancient warriors use meditation, and you know, even yeah, you know, if you look back, it's even yeah, you know, meditation is in the Bible too. Yeah, you know, Jesus went to uh, the Mount of Olives to meditate, and yeah. it's. In, you know, it's taught. It's taught in most of the major religions, ex- and it's weird that now in today's society, though, you know, many of the same practitioners of those religions, you know, look at it like, well, yeah, that's more of a new age type thing. We don't want to get into that, even though it's taught in their religion. They kind of pick and choose, you know, parts they're going to use. And if you really get it down, and there, there are se- several different types of meditation. And if you combine what we were talking about before with uh, your thoughts and energy into your meditation, then it becomes really powerful. You can combine you know, certain um, uh, thoughts and, and thinking on things that you want to uh, manifest in your life into your meditation. I, you know, for example, I have a meditation that uh, as soon as I find some free time, I'm going to you know, put it on a CD, and it's uh, called The Warrior's Cave. And you go down, and this is all, you know, mental uh, visualization as you're meditating. But you go down into this cave, and you have your teacher or your instructor, and, you know, you can customize it any way you want. But I have a room that I go into in this cave that is filled with all the wisdom books ever known to man. And I sit in that room and meditate and, you know, wait for the answer to whatever I need or I, or if I have something that I'm trying to manifest and I need to uh, work out in my life, you know, I take that into that room with me and, and meditate on it until I get the answer I want or until, you know, I feel, you know, good and calm inside about the situation. And it's uh, it's very powerful. Most people... You know, just don't know it. They say, "Oh, it's just a new age thing." You know, meditation, and you know, they think of you know the gurus in India, or you know, back when the Beatles went to India, that type thing. They don't see that it's actually a uh, scientifically proven, you know, not only uh, uh, um, I just went blank on you, not only mm-hmm. uh, something for your health, but it's a way to improve your life in every way, and it's a way to really make the uh, uh, manifestations of your thoughts much more powerful. Yeah, and I want to let my listeners know out there, you know, and that are listening to uh, Dr. Bodie Sanders, that this is actually what they call uh, white magic, and it's it's the magic of your thoughts, and you manifest them into reality, and you create them, and and those would be good things and, and things of light and truth into the world. And the people that might mean ill will will think the actual opposite. And that would be black magic where they they use their thoughts and their power to create negative things in the world. So that's essentially the magic is in each one of us. And we have that power to either create light and truth like Dr. Bodhi Sanders is with his books and his website and martial arts or you could use it to create darkness and um, hell on earth, you know, and that choice is, or that power is in all of us, and we create our own heavens and hells, and I think you're a, a perfect example of that. Well, thank you. Um, how would, and you're, you're everybody welcome. uses that, even if they don't believe Correct. it, like I said before. You know, we're they're, we're they're all magicians. One way or the <laughs> other. I mean, there is no in-between. There's no neutral. You're either using your thoughts for positive outcomes or you're using them for negative outcomes. And, Whether you know it or not. And, you know, even if you don't believe, and, and somebody that just heard what you said and they say, well, I don't want anything to do with this. It's magic and that's and against my religion. <laughs> but at the same time, they're using that and they don't even know it. You know, that's just, I mean, it's just scientific uh, uh, you know, fact that this works and this is the way that your mind works and this is what's happening. But most people don't know about that and, and they would say, oh, that's, that's crazy. It's just new age hocus pocus. Yeah. And they're using it every single day. And it's, it's, not, well, that, it's, not, any, it's not any more new age hocus pocus than, 
then, you know, getting up and exercising is good for your body. I mean, it's just how the human body, the human mind works. And Correct. it works that way whether you believe it. Just like you can believe that exercise is not good for you, but if you do it every day, you're going to get the same benefits as somebody who believes it is good for them. It's, uh, you know, it, it, you know, certain laws. You might have a bad attitude, though, but yeah. you still get the same benefits. You may right? not enjoy it, but <laughs> then you won't get as much benefit as the person exactly. who is positive about it. You know, even in, uh, you know, I told you I used to be into bodybuilding, and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger had a, uh, a giant bodybuilding book that came out, uh, I think, the early 80s or late 70s. And in that book, you know, he even explains this, and he talks about the power of your thoughts and that he has, has seen it with bodybuilders, that if you're concentrating on your muscles and you're concentrating on them growing and you're, you're visualizing them getting stronger, getting more flexible, you know, building up, you're going to see more results than a bodybuilder that goes in and is thinking about his bills and just going through the motion or he's just listening to the music and going through the motions and not really focusing his, his thoughts on seeing his muscles get bigger. And, uh, yeah, that's the same principle. I mean, you, you get what you put out. And I don't care you know, if it's in your martial arts practice or bodybuilding or your, your studies at school or your job or whatever, you're going to get back you know, what you put out. And the more effort, the more thoughts, the more action you put into it, the more you're going to see results coming back. I know you're really a wise man and you know the the current world we live in where you know having wisdom and being a warrior just doesn't mean you know gathering wisdom to to be smarter and to be wise and then also you know going to the the dojo to learn martial arts it's it's a complete lifestyle where we have to be warriors in all aspects of our life whether that be things coming down the pike from the government or whatever world we might live in. Um, what's your philosophy of this current world we live in and, and you being a warrior? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, things are, things are looking scary right now in this world. So I, you know, my philosophy is you only live one time and you need to live your life to the fullest. And, but you need to do it with character, honor, and integrity. But, and, and, and people look at that, oh, yeah, I don't want to do that. That's like, uh, <laughs> You know, you're you're tying me down. I can't enjoy this and this if I have to always be worried about doing the right thing. Well, you can still do the right thing and do stuff in the right way and live your life to the fullest and, and experience, you know, what the world has to offer. And people look at this and they, and they think, well, you know, he's talking about, um, you know, I have to always be thinking about what's right and wrong and, and doing the right thing thing and you know looking out all the time being aware of my surroundings and you know it's just, that sounds like a, you know just not a fun way to live something when well, you know I don't know what you're talking about I have lots of fun you know it's it has nothing to do with whether or not you're having fun you you're going to enjoy life you're going to live your life one way or the other but you know my philosophy is you want to experience as much and of of life as you can, but you want to do it in the right way. I mean, you can you can enjoy you know, a glass of Patron without being an alcoholic. You know, and and other people seem to take things to the extreme, or they have no balance or no discipline in their life. And if you don't have discipline and balance, then you're not going to be enjoying enjoying your life as much as you think, because you're going to have a monkey on your back one way or the other. And to me, yeah, I, I look at what Confucius said when you know his teachings. He talked about the superior man or the superior human being. He wasn't talking about somebody that is um, uh, you know, better than everybody else as far as thinking they're better. But he's talking about somebody who has higher standards for their self. And that's kind of what the warrior lifestyle is: is setting these higher standards that you live by and living by your standards. It's not restricting yourself and having a list of things that you can and can't do. You just know what your principles are and you live by them. And it's not like you're doing without, you know, well, I want to do this. You don't want to do that because your principles 
or what you want, and you live by those principles. You know, I don't want to go out and rob people in the streets, you know, because, you know, my principles don't allow for that. That's not right. And I, I want to do what's right, not what's what's profitable. And, you know, I say that, people say, well, it's not bad to make a profit and you know, have money. And of course it's not bad to, to make a profit and have money. But it is if you're going to screw other people over to get it. And, and so that that's kind of the, the uh, example of how the warrior lifestyle looks at, at things a little bit differently. You know, other people look at what's best for me. The You know, someone who lives a warrior lifestyle looks at, okay, what's best for me and what's right at the same time. You don't want to just do the first part. You've got to balance it out with what's right first, and then is it good for me, and decide what's good for you. But you don't just say, oh, it's good for me, let's do it no matter what. That goes along with, you know, you had mentioned the glass of Patron. You could either enjoy that glass of Patron here and there and, and be balanced, or you could let that glass of Patron control you where you're not balanced. And that's where discipline comes in. I mean, the alcoholic, you know, has, you know, a problem with discipline. And, well, you know, of course, there is the, uh, you know, the physical, you know, part of it, too. But mm -hmm. it started out with a discipline problem. Correct. And, uh, you know, it's not a problem with the alcohol or the, or the Patron. You know, it's a problem with self-control and self-discipline. Yeah, you know, there there's a lot of people who enjoy Patron. Who, uh, you know, it doesn't control their life. You know, if I want a glass of Patron, I control how much I drink and what I, when I drink and you know, how I enjoy it. It doesn't control me. And even if I want, you know, if I'm enjoying it and I want more and more, you know, I'm going to have the discipline to say, oh, you know, I don't don't need any more. Yeah, you know, I'm going to stop. And it's the same thing with everything in life. There, you no matter right. what you're doing, for, if you're, you know, golf or into fishing or no matter what it is in today's world, you can find a way to take it to the extreme. Everything is taken to the extreme today, and you have to discipline yourself to maintain balance. You know, it, no matter what, even your martial arts, you could go extreme with your martial arts where that's all you think about. That's all you do. And then you neglect your family or you neglect, you know, your finances or you neglect your meditation or whatever, and you're, you're going to get out of balance. No matter what you're doing, there is a way for you to get out of balance with it and go to the extreme if you're not careful and you don't discipline yourself. Yeah, it's a universal law. Yeah, if you put these, these traits to work, they work for you. And it's just, and it doesn't matter. It's not. It's not like they just work for me, or they just work for you, or they only work for, you know, these kind of people. They work for anybody who wants to, you know, actually, you know, do the the homework and do it and put them to work. And that's right. that's you know another reason that we don't see many people, you know, putting this in you know, or integrating these traits into their life, is it does take work. You know it. You know, it takes, you know, it just doesn't come natural. If you want, you know, what comes natural, you know, for a lot of people is, you know, you get up in the morning, sit on a comfortable couch and watch TV. That's easy mm -hmm. to do. It's hard to say, I, I don't feel like going and working out. I, I'd like to sit here and watch TV and watch, you know, just watch football all day, but I'm going to get up and do my workout. I'm going to, you know, I've got to get this done. I've got to get this done. And it takes discipline to do that. And a lot of people don't want to discipline their self and, and they don't discipline their self. And, and that's and then, why they get what they get and they are where they are. I mean, you have to, if you don't like your life or you don't like something about your life, then you've got to change something. If you keep doing the same thing you you always do, then nothing's going to change because you know, that's where you, you got to this point by doing that thing. And if you don't change that, then you're just going to keep getting this. You've got to, you know, you've got to work for what you want. It doesn't doesn't just, you know, come out of the blue. Yeah, and what what I'm finding is that all of us have things that we want to change or or make better in our life. And I don't think there's one person out there that can't look in the mirror and go, hey, you know, I I need to fix this or change this or be more disciplined in this area. And the hard part 
is is making the effort and actually doing it day in and day out where it actually becomes a discipline because if you don't do it day in and day out it, it doesn't become a di- discipline and a good habit right it has to be consistent and that's uh you know that's something that i was reading a book by uh uh one of the ninja masters that, that has several books out i can't hatsumi master hatsumi and um he was telling a story about he was pouring down rain and one of his students came to visit and they had sit and they had drinks and it was late into the night and you know, it was just pouring down and about one o'clock in the morning you know the student said well i think you know i'm ready to go to bed and hatsumi was getting up getting his shoes and coat on and he said well, what are you doing well I, I haven't gone for my daily walk today i'm going for my walk and that's a good example of somebody who is dedicated, you know, to their principles and their lifestyle. You know, you you have these things that you do, and you're going to do them no matter what. And if it's raining outside, you know, you doesn't change, you know, what you're you're going to do, or you know, as far as your routine and what you know what you need to do to keep uh, your lifestyle at where you want it. And so he went out in the pouring rain, went for his walk, came back, and, they, and the student said, you know, I don't understand why you went for a walk in this downpour. He said, that's the difference between you and me. I'm persistent mm-hmm. with my training. I train. You train when it's convenient to you. And uh, that's the way most people live their life. They do what, whatever feels good to them at the time without any thought to... Uh, What's best? What's best, or the overall plan, or what they want, their objectives in life. They just do what they feel like doing at the time. And if you do that on a consistent basis, then you're not going to get much done because it does take discipline to get the things you want out of life. Yeah, and I think that comes to once you get to that discipline point in your life where you do have discipline and wisdom then you could use your, your intuition to make good decisions as opposed to that guy that's sitting on the couch has no discipline and he's using his intuition to change the channels or go, you know, I'm not going to go to martial arts class today or I'm not going for that walk. It's really two different points of intuition that, that people are at. You're either on that side of the guy that's the couch potato that's not really getting anything done and this is all mumbo jumbo to him or you're on the side of you know, Dr. Bodhi Sanders, where you want to, you know, better yourself and you, you want to do those things that are going to make yourself better. And you really, there's two choices that we could make. And you either take that choice of the, the lazy guy that lets the TV think for him and the, and the media, or you, you take life by the horns and, and you gain wisdom right. and discipline and, and so forth. And you be self-reliant. And, that and that's what you doesn't use his intuition at all. That a lot of people just drowned it out. I mean, you have to you have to spend time in meditation, and you have to learn how to use your intuition. You can't, and you know, if you're constantly, you know, watching the TV and have, or on the computer or on texting on the phone or you know, have something going in your mind, you, you can't listen to your intuition. You've got to be able to quiet your mind in order to listen to your intuition, and it takes practice to do that. And again, it takes discipline to make yourself practice to get to the point of doing that. And it just, I guess to most people it seems like too much work to, to live that way, and, and most people don't. And that's why you see that, you know, the, the successful, happy people today seem to be in a, in a minority as compared to the average person because they just don't see that it's worth the effort to do these things. And, it, and on the surface, it looks like it's not worth the effort. It looks like, oh, my God, that's a lot of work. I don't want to have to do this and do that and do that. If I do all that, I won't have time to do what I want to do. You know, it's a lifestyle. You, you change it. You make sacrifices it until you do want to do that, and you miss it when you don't do it. You want to do that instead of sit down and watch eight hours of movies or you know, you know, spend the whole day on the golf course every three seconds you have. You mm-hmm. get to the point that, you know, I want something different with my life, and this is how I get it, and I am going to make myself do it until it becomes a habit, and I'm going to be persistent in it. And then once you get to that point, you're going to start seeing things fall into place that uh, 
that you couldn't even have imagined before. I read, uh, I was reading one book, and I can't remember what book I read it in, but um, it talked about you know, the law of attraction and uh, intuition and putting faith in, in letting the process work. And it talked about what you can see. You know, a lot of people say, well, I, I can't even imagine myself doing that or living like that. It's because what they can imagine is only what they can see. And they can only see, you know, a small portion of what's happening. It's like, uh, like a, a, a guy that's watching planes on a radar. He can only see the planes that are on the radar. There's a lot of stuff way off the radar that he's not seeing. And that's the same thing with with uh, manifesting what you want in your life. You know, you don't have to know how it's going to happen. You just have to do your part and believe that there's, you know, even if you can't see a way for it to happen, you just got to realize that you're only seeing a very, very small part of what's happening in the universe. And, you know, it may be just off your radar what's coming in to your life, but you can't see it at this moment. You just got to have confidence and faith that you've done what you can do, and now the universe is taking care of the rest of it. And, you know, most people just can't quite uh, you know, comprehend that part. They can't, you know, they, to them, that's like, uh, it doesn't even make sense to me. But it worked, and it, right. and it uh, builds your confidence in the process. And you got to you got to start out just like everything else. You got to start out with you know walking before you run. And so you start using this on small things, and then you mm-hmm. see, and you get this success and that success, and then you see, oh, that, you know, I think this really does work. And then the more you build up your confidence, the more you start using your thoughts in the proper way. And then the more you see bigger things manifesting in your life, and it just kind of starts to snowball until as long as you're persistent with it and as long as you believe in the process, I mean, that's that's a major uh, factor. A lot of people, they try it for two or three weeks, and they say, oh, you know, this doesn't work. You know, I tried it for three weeks, didn't see anything. Well, it's not like a, a magic spell that you just say, okay, I'm going to do this, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rich. I mean, it's a mm-hmm. process. It's not like flipping on a light switch. It takes time, and you have to be persistent. And it's just like, uh, for example, planting a garden. You don't go plant seeds and then go out there the next day and expect to have a, you know, a garden full of tomatoes. It takes. Yeah. It has to go through the proper phases and steps, and then you have to take care of it, and you have to keep the weeds out of it. And so many people want to do this over two or three weeks, and then say and it doesn't something. work, and that's like them planting uh, tomato seeds and saying, "Ah, oh, this I don't think this is growing. I don't think it's working." They go out there and dig it up. Oh yeah, it's, it's I'm it's not a good gardener, work, but it's not working very good. They put it back in, or they throw it away, and they they interrupt the process, and so they never get to the to the stage of manifesting what they want because they continually, you know, either quit or they continually let doubt and disbelief dig up their seeds and, and you know, make it where they can't manifest what they want. That's a great analogy. I like that you've put it with the gardener or the farmer. You know, we have to cultivate the soil and then water it and then, you know, wait for the harvest. And part of that, it takes patience. And that doesn't mean you're just, you know, sitting there on the couch waiting for things to happen. You're actually working, yeah, you've got you know, to, to make care of it. Yeah. If you, if you don't so what, take care of it, and that goes for anything in your life, just like your martial arts training. Even if you train and you get to be a black belt, you've got to maintain that. You can't just, you know, I, I can, I've got a Zen garden here in, uh, at my house, and it's beautiful, but if I don't go out, and even though it's already uh, planted and grown and, and matured, if I just let it go and decide to do nothing anymore, then it will fall apart. Weeds will take it over, and it, it won't be like it is anymore. And it's the same thing with anything. If you, you know, no matter how far you paddle up a river, when you stop paddling, you're going to drift back down. And you know, it doesn't matter if it's your martial arts or if you're trying to manifest stuff with your thoughts and actions. 
you know, if you, if you quit, then you start to regress, and that that's just the way it works in life. And it doesn't matter if it's your martial arts, your golf game, or you know, using your mind. If you don't use it, you lose it. And, it, and you know, a lot of people make that mistakes with martial arts. So their goal is to get a black belt, and once they get that black belt, they've achieved their goal and they quit. And then a year, two years later, they they're you know going somewhere, going out for the night, and they think, oh, you know, I you know we're fine. I can take care of ourselves. I'm a black belt. Well, this, and it hasn't trained in two years. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't trained in two years. Well, you know, you're not a black belt anymore. You're not. You, know, you might have a black belt you earned at one time, but there's a difference in a practicing black belt and someone who had a goal to get their black belt and quit. Yeah, no, and us of the, us that are in martial arts, I know we've all seen the the black belt that has come in the dojang or dojo that hasn't practiced in two years and. You know, they think they're going to get to the front of the line where it's actually they're they're going to get a white belt and <laughs> earn that black belt back if they have the right master, you know, instructor that teaches truth. You know, because you know I've I've experienced some of these black belts that haven't trained in three, five, ten years, and they literally forget a lot of everything, but they they get it back quickly. But you know, they kind of go in there with the ego, like I'm a black belt, but well, wait, dude, I'm training every day and I could kick your ass right now. Yeah, and so. it's and it's uh, it's one thing. <laughs> when that happens in the dojo, uh, it's, but it's a totally different thing when this guy goes out in the street and he's accosted uh-huh. by th- some thug and he thinks, hey, I can kick your ass, I'm a black belt, and he can't, he can't even kick a, you know, a front <laughs> kick because he hasn't stretched in months and months. Throughout his growing. And <laughs> the thug just mops the street with him. And, uh, yeah. you know, that's, and that's, you know, I think it's, it's, it's kind of natural for people to think that way. You know, oh well, you know, I've achieved this. I'm this, and once they stop, you start going back down the river, and you are not the same place anymore. You're not the same person. And uh, I think one of the quotes in one of my books says, uh, "The uh, the donkey, or I think it says, the jackass that, that considers itself a stag finds its mistake when it goes to jump over the ditch." <laughs> and uh, it's the same thing. It applies to martial arts. These people who just get their black belt and quit think you know, that they are tough and they can defend themselves when they need to. But when they when they you know when their backs against the wall, they find out that they're not who they thought they were, and that's yeah. that's the wrong time to have that that, that, <laughs> that revelation come out. Is when you know somebody is pulling a, a weapon on you or trying to mug you, and you think, "Oh, well, I'm a black belt." Oh, but you know I haven't done anything for two years. I, uh, but I can, I'm still a black belt, and then then they're in trouble. It applies oh. to everything in life, right? And uh, if you know, and, and the older you get, the faster you regress too. It's far as far as you know sports. Uh, yeah. or martial arts it just gets where it takes more to keep you in the same condition not less and as people get older they seem to put less effort in and therefore they're regressing faster and they need to realize that and not think that they can do the same things that they uh, you know, could do when they were younger and they were practicing every day and really working out um, like I said you know, I used to be in bodybuilding and I've been, you know, had some health issues with my elbows and haven't been able to lift weights for quite a while now. And it would be silly of me to go back in the weight room when my elbows are are feeling better and try to start bench pressing what I was bench pressing when I quit working out a year and a half or so. (laughs) Uh, You know, waiting on my elbows to get better. If I did that, you know, I'd I'd have you know more issues than my elbows hurting because you just can't stop quit for a while and then think you're going to walk back in and be at the same level that you were when you were in good condition and working out. And uh, that seems to be you know, a bigger problem in martial arts than than other areas because people think, oh yeah, I'm a black belt, and that's that's all they have in their head. They, can't, they see their self as they were when they got their black belt. And mm-hmm. maybe two years later, even if they haven't done anything, they, that's still the mental image they have of their, of their self is when they were 
you know, getting their black belt, and they were sparring every day, and, and they were, you know, really good. And that's the mental image they have, just like, you know, I still have that mental image of, of me benching 250 pounds. Whether I went down, if I go down to my workout room right now and try to bench 250 pounds, you know, I'm going to be hurting. And, you know, a lot of people lose that common sense and that reasoning on the street when they think, you know, well, I, I'm a black belt, I can take care of myself. And that they lose, they don't see the, the other part where, oh, I haven't been training for two years, so maybe I'm not <laughs> as uh, proficient as I used to be. That, that, for some reason, they just don't seem to be able to, to wrap their mind around that thought. They just keep the thought that I'm a black belt. And uh, that, that can be a dangerous, uh, dangerous thought pattern. You know, if you're, you're out on the street and you run into trouble. Yeah, you know, it's a lifestyle. It's got to be a lifestyle. It's, and uh, like uh, Master Hasumi said, you you got to be persistent. If you're not persistent, if you're not moving ahead, you're moving backwards. And, and you're either doing one or the other. There's no standing still. And it's just, uh, it ha- that's the reason that, you know, a true martial artist or a true warrior, it has to be their lifestyle, not just something they do two nights a week. You know, it, it has to be a lifestyle that you live daily, that you, uh, you, know, you can think about, you work out, you concentrate on, and you have to balance all the parts to it. And it, if you can't, you can't do that if you don't make it a lifestyle because it's just, you know, people are too busy, and if it's not your lifestyle, it's going to fall to the wayside. It's, you know, things are going to get in the way. Your, you know, your finances, your job, your kids, whatever. There's so many things that people are, you know, having their life. And if you don't make that a priority, then it starts to fade away. What's next for Bodie Sanders, The Wisdom Warrior? Well, I, uh, like I said, you know, my next book that I'm working on now is, uh, you know, has to do with a lot of what we've talked about today. You know, the, energy of your thoughts and applying that to uh, your martial arts practice and, and to your to the warrior lifestyle. Uh, that's the next project I have. I also have the uh, medita- Warrior Cave Meditation CD uh, on my <laughs> very big to-do list. And, uh, <laughs> on top of the 90 hours you're doing now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah I've gotta, I'm going to have to find more time in a week here. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, it's you know I, I've got a I've got a very big to do list uh, of, of projects and books that uh, I've got to find the time to get done here. But uh, yeah, modern bushido has just exploded so much. You know, it's uh, it's been in the top ten for fifty seven weeks now, and uh, it's hit number one six times during that that time period. Wow. And uh, once that happened, things started snowballing so much that I just, uh, it's just unreal how busy I've been here. Do you ever see yourself possibly getting out of teaching maybe and pursuing this full time, or are you always going to be a teacher? Uh, you know, I'm always going to be a teacher one way or another. Even even get out of teaching, I, I'll be teaching, you know, my philosophy about the warrior lifestyle. But as far as, you know, public school teaching, uh, I, yeah, I would like to get out of that and be uh, you know, do this full time simply because this is a full time job. Just like I said, it, you know, it's taken us months to connect here. It's just because I'm so busy, I just you know, I don't have time to do everything, and I've got a lot that I need to do with my books and, and the uh, warrior lifestyle that uh, is is kind of kind of getting pushed to the side a little bit, you know, because I've got such a, a you know, long hours on my job here yeah but, uh, it, uh, hopefully at some point I'll be able to focus completely on my uh, teachings and writings well if, if I know uh, Bodie Sanders he's already visualized that in his mind and it's, <laughs> it's, it's on the future plate and it's gonna happen it just hasn't manifested yet and, and with everything that you're doing you're not leaving this to chance you're you're thinking it you're living it you're you're doing the actions, whether that be 90 hours a week or whatever it takes to make this happen. You're doing what it takes, and your background in martial arts and, and discipline and, and teaching has taught you to do that. So I personally, 
I see the momentum that you're building on your own, you know, and I didn't really know. I thought you had a team working for you, but no. now I now I know the truth. <laughs> yeah, right now it's just me, and and I, yeah, I kind of like it that way. When when you're when you're the sole person in charge, you know, you can get stuff done the way you want it done, the right way. And uh, it's uh, you know, I've I've had several businesses and you know, with you know several employees and stuff, and it seems like you know the old adage of you want it done right, do it yourself. Yeah, is is true. <laughs> Definitely. So I, Def- I, uh, yeah, I, I do a lot of it myself. My wife, you know, is you know, she's also a teacher, so she is my editor. She edits my books, and you know, I am a columnist for uh, Taekwondo Times, and uh, you know, she edits my stuff that I send into them. And uh, I've got I've got a lot of irons in the fire. <laughs> that's uh, to put it on the, the lighter side of things but um, great talking to you today Bodhi where's the best place for people to get updates on your work would that be the wisdomwarrior.com well the wisdomwarrior.com is my website and uh, uh, I, I update that not as often as I should but my uh, Facebook profile and, and I also have a page on Facebook called uh, Warrior Wisdom and the Warrior Lifestyle, and I update those daily. Uh, so Facebook is probably the best place to uh, to you know, keep up with what's going on with me, and uh, you know all of my books and everything, of course, are listed on my website, thewisdomwarrior.com. Okay, yeah, and to let the listeners know out there, I'm also a a fan of his Facebook page, so I, I like his page, and I get a probably two or three quotes a day from Bodhi, and, and they're always awesome. And then, of course, he'll put some articles a couple times a week with what's going on in martial arts or what he feels that we need to hear, and they're always real informative and cool. So, well, I appreciate you know, that. No, thank you. And uh, it's, it's an honor to interview people that I'm a fan of their work and, and get to talk to them for an hour and a half, even if it takes two months to get, <laughs> you know, have this conversation. I'm sorry about that. I know that was <laughs> ridiculous trying to connect. I'm just... Yeah, been slammed here. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and to be honest with you, Bodie, I'm I'm learning this with people that are are doing things in life and creating. You know, it's not the easiest things to do, and we're we're all busy. And then when you're creating, you're you're kind of stuck in your head and your routine, and you have a discipline. So when someone comes at you from outside the circle and kind of wants to get into your life, it's it's hard to make room. So. I appreciate that you found some balance and fit me in. <laughs> well, I appreciate you having me on your show, Mo. Definitely. And um, I I think a lot of people out there that come to my website, it's the Gnostic Warrior, which Gnostic, you know, this is Greek for knowledge, you know, so I'm big on uh, distributing knowledge, but I also am a big fan of martial arts and I wanted to have more people such as yourself who aren't only just in martial arts, but also are living the the warrior lifestyle. And there's another gentleman that's a Navy SEAL. He has a website called Intuitive Warrior. And um, then yours is Wisdom Warrior, and that kind of gave me the idea for Gnostic Warrior, to be to, to be honest with you. I wanted to kind of go along the same path of distributing that. So you are an inspiration for me, and I think that a lot of people that are listening are going to be inspired by you. And, and definitely check out his books. Go to thewisdomwarrior.com and um, get some of his books and get started and support him. And I, again, I see you in the next year or two with the momentum you're building. You know, all the I think over thirty thousand people have subscribed to your updates on Facebook. That you'll before you know it, you'll have a hundred thousand. Yeah, I looked at. Uh, you know, I was going back. Uh, I guess it was Friday, and went back a month just to see where I was on Facebook. On, you know, this time last year, and uh, this time last year, I think I had around ten thousand readers, and today I've got over eighty thousand. And, uh, it, that's it, it. That's not even counting my website. So it, it has really exploded, and I think it's because a lot of people see that that this is a missing aspect of the martial arts, and a lot of people see that they need to get back to this, and they need to get back to the to the philosophy that I teach in the warrior lifestyle about uh, you know you know, that your character matters, and you you need to live with honor, you need to have a code of ethics, and to live with integrity and all these things and that they're seeing yeah you know that's the way you know my granddad was 
you know, why why have we gotten away from that? And they're starting to see that, yeah, this is the way I want to live my life, and and I think they just needed to be reminded. Yeah, and it's great that the you know the United States martial arts the they recognize you as the author of the year. So you're not only getting recognized by people such as myself and your fans, but you're also getting recognized by your peers, which is really important. So that's been very rewarding. I uh, I've had four different uh, martial arts hall of fame induct me into the martial arts hall of fame. You know, not because of my martial arts skills, but because of my teaching and my writings as a uh, um, as, as helping the martial arts and being you know really finding an area that martial arts has uh, kind of gone away from, and uh, that that's been very rewarding. And then on top of that, my books have won uh, several national awards from different uh, book award programs, and so it's you're getting recognized not only by you know, the literary public, but the uh, martial arts world too, which is very rewarding. Yeah, that that is an honor, and it shows when you do things from your heart, and then you work daily from your heart and love that good things will manifest in your life. And you know, you haven't quit after all these awards and best-selling accolades, and you're still working hard. So. I commend you, Bodhi, and you're an inspiration for all of us. I wish you the best in all that you do. Well, I appreciate that, Mo, and I wish the best for you, too. All right. Take care, buddy. All right. I'll talk to you later. We'll do this again sometime. Definitely. All right. Have a good day. All right. You, too. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.